Joining us right now, first time we've talked to him since uh, the original spring training, which seems like it was about two and a half years ago when we went down to Mesa, Arizona. The voice of the A's, one of the absolute best in the business, class act on and off the field, our good friend Ken Korak. Ken, it's Dave. Good morning. Hey, Dave. How you doing, man? It's good to be with you. It's good to be with you, too. Great job last night, unfortunately, in a loss, and I appreciate the uh, quick turnaround. I I always feel guilty. I know you worked late last night. 8.05 is pretty darn early, but you've always uh, worked very hard for uh, all the A's fans in the Sacramento region, and, and they all appreciate it, and I appreciate it, Ken. Well, you know, I'm a pretty early riser, so 8.05 is not really a major problem for me, to be honest with you. <laughs> I re- but, but I appreciate you saying that. No, no problem. Thanks for saying it. You know, I, I remember the first time we met. I was thinking about this last night knowing you were coming on. Uh, and I, I forget. I don't expect you to remember either, but we were talking about music. And this is a side of you a lot of people don't know that I absolutely love. And I can't remember, Ken, if we were talking about mutual love. Was it for Zeppelin, Fleetwood Mac, Three Dog Night? It was one of the – do I, well, any of those bands stand out to you? Doobie Brothers? Yeah, I'm a you know, I mean, I'm dating myself, but I started to get into rock and roll back in the '60s. Yeah, and interesting, I, when everybody was into Zeppelin, I think I've gained a greater appreciation for them as I've gotten older. I wasn't a huge Zeppelin fan back then, uh, but I mean, I have great respect for what they've accomplished. So, mm-hmm. I guess of all the groups you mentioned, maybe Fleetwood Mac would yeah. stand out. Uh, from the the three or four you just mentioned, I think that's why. And I'm an old Bay Area guy, right. so mo- a lot of my, you know, a lot of my choices kind of come from the California influence too. I think that's maybe why we clicked because it's the exact same thing with Led Zeppelin to me. I, I I can put on a Led Zeppelin record and pick a random song, and I know who it is the moment it starts playing, and it's just absolutely classic. Perfect drummer, perfect guitarist, perfect singer. Uh, but I'm I'm with you. I'm a Fleetwood Mac guy. When I saw I saw Fleetwood Mac perform their album The Dance. I think it was on the uh, it was in L. A. It was when they had uh, the USC band come in for uh, Tusk at the very end, and that was really oh, the yeah. first time I'd actually paid attention when uh, Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham were glaring at each other during Silver Springs. And I took a deep dive whenever the heck this was back in ninety six, ninety seven, and ever since I've been I've been obsessed with Fleetwood Mac. Well, you know, starting in the late 60s and in like the mid-70s, I saw all the, the great English bands. I mean, Stones two or three times, uh, Traffic, uh, The Who, uh, you know, a bunch of those bands would come to, you know, I started college in San Diego, so huh. uh, we saw pretty much everybody when they came in. You got to pick one, Beatles or Rolling Stones, who do you go with? I've always been a Stones guy. Uh. I really have. I mean, that's not to discourage <laughs> the Beatles. Right, but I mean, and and they're still putting out records. And what Jagger is seventy seven, right? Yes, I I mean, come on, (laughs) he's still he's still doing it. So I have a lot of respect for those guys. Well, to your point, then we'll talk A's baseball. But I just saw this last week. I uh, I'm on Spotify all the time, and they have a a a thing of uh, new releases each and every week. I don't know if you knew this or not, but uh, I think it was last, what was it, the 22nd. So a week ago today, last Wednesday, the Rolling Stones put out a song called Scarlet with special guest guitarist Jimmy Page. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. But, you know, they put out a, a song after the virus really hit, you know, so many people, and it's still, it's still a huge factor, of course. But, like, Ghost Town, I think, was the name of the, the single they put out, right? I think I, I think you're absolutely right, and if you yeah. if you get a chance to listen to this song called Scarlet, it uh, the best I can do. And this is a huge stretch, can it sounds like uh, it sounds like Mick Jagger is singing for Led Zeppelin. That's exactly what it's. Well, it's, it's Jimmy's guitar <laughs> and Mick's voice. Okay, so, well, I'll take it. I'll have to check it out. There you go. We'll expect a Ken Korak review uh, coming up here in uh, the next month when we talk to him. Not a uh, great review of the game last night as I uh, try to transition over there. Ken, hey, listen, it was a, a good weekend uh, for the A's. Obviously, things are strange. Things are weird. I don't know if it was they were flat. I don't know if it was just the Rockies bombarded them. It, it, it just, this, was, this, was not a, uh, this was not the best game of the year for the Oakland Athletics. It wasn't a vintage performance, and one of the things that's happened is even though they're three and two, so they're off to an okay start, is that the starters just haven't been getting deep into games, Dave. Yeah. And last night was the story again, where Mingan only gave them four innings, and then you look at, and Bo Mel mentioned this before the game, that they had a bunch of their uh, bullpen guys down, and so I guess that there's really there are no silver linings uh, when you lose, but they didn't go to their top guys, so they they should be rested for today. 
and Jordan Williams made his major league debut. Lou Trevino came in at a very tough inning. And I think even though the Rockies had a tough series off, they took two out of three from the Rangers, but they only had 16 hits, and they're a much better offensive team than that. So you kind of fear that they're going to get hot against you, and that's what happened last night. Plus, the A's were 0 for 8 with runners in scoring positions, so you're not going to win too many games if that happens. Ken, I want to get back to the bullpen real quick. They pitched 20 and a third innings, I think, a scoreless baseball in that um, opening series against the Angels. With Puck and Lazardo still out in that starting rotation, are you getting a little, I don't think afraid is the right word, but is there a little bit of worry there that Bob Melvin might have to overuse that bullpen really early in the season? Well, it's a concern, but I think almost every club in baseball is dealing with that because of the shortened training camp. Uh, three weeks is not enough time to get your starting pitchers ready to go deep into games. Now, that's going to have to change. I still really like the rotation. And it won't be long before Lazardo is in the rotation. I think there's a decent chance that he might pitch out of the bullpen today and back up Frankie Montas. And if he doesn't do that, he'll pitch over the weekend, whether starting or relieving uh, in one of those capacities uh, against the Mariners up there. So I'm not overly concerned about it. That being said, the starters will have to get deeper into games because the A's after this, see, they have a day off tomorrow. And I think starting Friday, they have 30 games in 31 days. Yeah. So that'll that'll chew up your bullpen if your starters can't get a little bit deeper. Boys of the A's, Ken Korak joining us. Uh, I want to preface this next question, Ken, by saying something you know better than anyone. You know, Chris Davis, uh, he doesn't have a bad reputation at all with the media. He just, it's not the most... I don't even want to say media friendly. He just doesn't really get into the whole media thing. And we had a conversation uh, at spring training. It's one of my favorite interviews I've ever done. We we got Chris Davis to sit down with us, but only if we talked to him about video games and didn't ask a baseball question. And I will tell you the laughing, the the joking, that just he was so into it. And it was really a great visit with him. I love Chris Davis, and I fell in love with him even more when we got a chance to actually get to know his personality a little bit. But I'm worried about him. Ever since, I think, that that game in May, I want to say, a year ago when he crashed into the wall, it just seems that something's been off. Do you think it's rust? Do you think it's age? Do you, what, what's going on with Chris, to the best of your knowledge? Well, you're right, and you pinpointed the time when the struggles began because it was in Pittsburgh when yeah. he went uh, into foul territory to make a catch and crash into that the side wall there and hurt his hip. And as Bullmel said after the game yesterday, it looks, it looks like he's pressing. Now, he, he's coming off a down year last year. He wasn't that productive, but he was um, hurt as well. So he left nine runners on base last night, yeah. uh, and that's tough, and he's 0 for 15 to start the season. So... It's really tough when that happens to begin a season because now you're wondering if I, you know, am I ever going to get a hit? If those things happen in the middle of a 162 game season, I don't think it's that big a deal. So uh, he may be pressing right now. So I think there would be some concern. He could be natural. You know, Chris really is a very good guy. He just shies away from the spotlight. Yeah. He doesn't like talking about himself, and he's not the only guy. You know, Mark McGuire. Yep. When he was with the A's, uh, you know, I was I learned very early that he's a very good interview. He was a good interview, but you don't want to ask him about himself. He was great talking about the team. So uh, Chris is just one of those guys that just doesn't like doesn't like the media spotlight. That's not a negative necessarily. It's just the way that he is. Sure, love Chris. Yeah, Ken Korak, voice of the A's, joining us. Uh, Ken, a guy I liked a lot last year in spots for the A's and has really had a great start of the season is Mark Canna. Is Canna a guy you see as basically an everyday starter going forward, and what has his impact been on the team so far in your eyes? Well, yeah, and he had a great year last year. He had one really one of the best years, considering he didn't play every day of any outfielder in the American League. And he's off to a really good start. He's made tremendous progress from the time that he joined the A's until now using the whole field, going the other way. His strike zone discipline is a lot better. The A's, it's a good problem to have because Lariano is going to play every day in center field unless he needs a day off. So now you've got three guys for two spots, which would be Grossman, Piscotti, and Canna. And Bo Mello talked before the game yesterday about how that's kind of the, the most difficult thing for him right now in trying to arrange for the, the playing time day to day. Now, if Chris continues to struggle, you might see one of those guys jump into the DH spot as well because they have that kind of depth. So we'll just have to see how that plays out. But I'm a big fan of Mark Cannon. Speaking of being big fans, as we talked to Ken Korak, 
anytime the Rockies and A's get together, which, which isn't very often, but when they, when anytime they play, can't help but think. I, I always think about the third string shortstop at El Toro High School in 2009 in Southern California. And, and imagine being the third string shortstop. And in front of you is a guy named Nolan Arenado, who's a senior. And then backing up Nolan Arenado, only when Nolan pitched, was this other kid, this Matt Chapman guy, who uh, as a sophomore uh, w- was playing there. Now you see, the, in my opinion, probably the two best third basemen in baseball, certainly the two best fielding third basemen in baseball. Not only is it fun, Ken, I would imagine, to watch them match up, but when you watch Matt Chapman, and you want to talk about, by the way, great interviews, Matty's my favorite. That, that, that guy has charisma oozing. Um, he doesn't get it on a national scale, it seems, Ken, but I, I was just hoping you could kind of mm-hmm. opine a little bit on how special this kid really is. Yeah, and I think they came from the same high school. And he's really an amazingly impactful player. Now, he didn't, like you said, it was, I'm glad you mentioned that because Arnado was a senior. He was a sophomore. He actually didn't play that much right. that year. He was a scrawny kid by his own admission. He said he was like 5'5 five, five or 5'6. Five, so right. you really blossomed after that. But he has a chance to be one of the all-time great third basemen. I mean, defensively, he'll go down, I think, um, as one of the best defenders that's ever played the position. That sounds like a piece of hyperbole because he's only had a couple of full years in the big leagues, but he's really an impactful player. And, and you can say that about a lot of these. And I've mentioned this, talked about it last night on the broadcast. Um, you're not going to be a great team and advance a long ways in the playoffs unless you have guys who can really impact the game. And he can in, in many ways. He's underrated with his speed. Yeah. I mean, he can really run. He's a gifted athlete. And he's also a really tough kid. He's a leader on the club, and he's one of the hardest workers on the team. So when your best players are your hardest workers, it's really easy for the rest of the guys to fall in line. Ken Korak joining us. Ken, we're radio guys, so by nature we're kind of audio nerds, mm. and we have been... Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. well, I'm glad, and so I'm glad we're going to talk about this because we have been so impressed. Obsessed with, with this. With the with the A's radio presentation as far as the use of... When you tune into KHTK and you're listening to the A's call, you can't tell there's no fans in the game. Nope. I was kind of hoping you could give us a little peek behind the curtain on both what you know, if you've had to change your approach at all when it comes to broadcasting the games with no fans, and kind of a peek behind the curtain of how you guys have been able to implement all of this sound. It's magic. Yeah. It's a great illusion. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, first of all, I have to say this. Mike Baird, who's our engineer, is an audio whiz. Uh, he is brilliant when it comes to all the technical aspects of doing what we do. So any kudos would have to go to Mike because he is, incredibly good and one of the things that mike now for instance on friday the A's are in seattle but we're going to do the game from the coliseum off the tv monitors and mike has a tremendous amount of experience doing international competitions like he's done the olympics for years and the world cup so he's been involved in a lot of these kind of tricky audio scenarios where you're sending feeds out over all over the world and people are doing games off monitors like we're doing but so he's really good in mi- at, at mixing a game, but it's not. It's really not that big a secret. I mean, they're piping the crowd noise in through the PA system at the Coliseum. Mm-hmm. Everybody can hear it in the ballpark, and so obviously a lot of that is filtering through our crowd mics. Mike also has um, a microphone right on the screen uh, to pick up what they call home plate, and also the bat crack. You always hear that really crisp sound on a well hit ball if the ball hitting the bat. We also pick up on the TV effects from NBC California. So there's, there are a lot of things being inputted into his board as he mixes the game up there. So uh, he does an incredibly good job. We have very good microphones, I think. Uh, Vince uses a headset. I use a stick mic. That stick mic is 180 years old. I don't know what would happen <laughs> if something happened to it. Uh, we're also in different booths. And I've been told that people can't tell the difference. Like, I'm in the visiting TV booth. And uh, Vince is in the home radio booth. So, but any kudos I think would have to go to Mike Berry. And you know, it's funny. This is real inside baseball here, but uh, the guy Ken's talking about, Mike Bird, or we call him Birdie out here, is uh, 
he also does Kings broadcasts. Oh, he, he also does Kings broadcasts, and I've I've been had a chance to talk to him off the air, and I won't share, tell tales out of school, obviously, Ken. But just hearing you break down it from that end, and then hearing Mikey break it down from the other end, and you're right these 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 people do not get the credit they deserve. And I don't know if you can have had the opportunity, or even if you would want to listen to. Um, your broadcast, any piece of it uh, outside of the booth, just in your car or something. But we are obsessed with it. We go over it every day. And not only do we think baseball is lapping the NBA right now when it comes to crowd presentation, and that might change, but the A's in particular, of all the teams I have watched, not just visual presentation, but you know this better than anyone. Um, This is getting really nerdy now. A's audio is unique in the sense that not only do you have all the gnat sound that everybody else has, but you've got the horns and the vuvuzelas and the drums and all that, and it's all being piped in, not just on radio, but TV. I think they're doing the best job in sports right now in in creating this fake, quote-unquote, audio in a real experience. (laughs) Well, thank you for saying that on behalf of the ball club. And Amelia Schimmel runs things for um, in uh, A's Vision. And she's also filling in for uh, Dick Callahan on the public address. So kudos to, hear, yeah. to her and David Don and everybody else over there. Uh, because, you know, David's been over there for as long as I have, which is 25 years. So uh, they do a great job. It's kind of a surreal experience for me to do the games because there's nobody there, obviously. Right. We're not trying to fool anybody into thinking that there, there are people there. But I can hear all that in my headset, so I'm constantly hearing that drum beat. Yeah. And that drum beat is like the heartbeat of the ballpark yep. now. Yep. And it's the soundtrack. And so even though nobody is there, it sounds familiar to me. Mm-hmm. Like I'm home doing the game. So I mean there's nothing there's nothing normal about anything right now that we're doing, but I think it gives a like a sense of normalcy, so um, all the people involved I think uh, deserve some kudos for that. And I do say this. It may be my bias as a radio guy that because I've listened to a lot of the broadcasts, I've listened back to some of ours because I want to hear what the mix sounds like. I think compared to television, the radio sounds more like a, a real game than TV. Agreed. Because, and I think the TV guys are doing a great job. Sure. I mean, our guys, the production crew is incredible, but it's hard to get past the fact that you're seeing an empty stadium. On the radio, it still sounds like a regular game, right? Because you hear that hum of the crowd underneath. Yep. So uh, maybe that's an illusion, but that's the per- that's the perception I have of it. Last thing for you, Ken Korak. Um, just one final point there. You're, you're the pros pro, and you work with pros. So I, I, I get it. And you've also, and this is no offense to A's fans, please, but, but you know, you have worked in front of smaller crowds sometimes and bigger, more energetic crowds uh, at other times, both home and on the road. But in this, in this specific scenario with no crowds, have you found it at all uh, a challenge to get up for the calls to, to uh, kind of, uh, your energy levels being appropriate for the time. Is that a challenge or do you tune all that out? And are you able to just block everything out and call it as if there were 40,000 people there? Well, it's my job to do the best I can and to be a professional about it. I don't know whether we, I succeed or fail. That's up to other people to determine that, but I haven't found it to be that big a challenge so far. Mm -hmm. Um, It may be because I'm hearing the, the piped in crowd noise in my headset. I think it would be a, a greater challenge if it was totally silent in there because, you know, in the big moments, they do kind of make it louder. Sure. So, you know, all this is really hard to describe, but, you know, it's my job to to entertain people and to try to do a credible, accurate account of the game, and I should be able to do that. I've been doing this for almost 40 years, so um, it shouldn't be that hard. Now, the most, the challenging thing is when the team is on the road. And doing the game off the TV monitor, which we've, we've done once while the A's were in San Francisco for the exhibition game last Tuesday. And we'll, we're going to see how that goes. Now, obviously, that, that'll that be the greatest challenge for us from a, a play-by-play standpoint. And we'll see how that goes beginning on Friday in Seattle. Well, I hope you can tell from our questions that you, and you're a very <laughs> humble man, but you're doing above and beyond and it does come through and we're so proud we're so proud to carry what i think are the the best 
audio broadcasts and baseball radio on our station. We're, we're proud of the partnership and, and you guys in a, in a real difficult scenario, you, the crew you talked about behind the scenes, uh, on behalf of all the fans listening, Ken, are, are just doing such a wonderful job and we thank you. Well, I appreciate that, Dave. And as I've said many times, the relationship with KHDK has meant the world to us. So your support means everything to us and all the A's fans out in Sacramento, up and down the valley. It's it's really important to us, too. So uh, I appreciate it, and it's been great being with you. All right. Thank you, Ken. Have a great call. You take care. Okay, Dave. Right. Thank you. It's the Carmichael Dave Show on Sports 1140 KHDK.